Arsenal are doing the transfers, and as long as you love some of them, that's good enough for me. This is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. Yeah, Arsenal are uh, doing the transfers. The window has slammed open. That's right. The transfer window slams shut. Do you know it can slam open? Well, it has slammed open, damn it. And uh, Arsenal are doing the business. Now, you don't have to like all the business, but hopefully you will like some of the business, and we will debate what of the business we like and what of the business may be remaining and what that business means for our prospects this weekend and beyond. And uh, more than anything, what we want to do is just thank you for being here. You don't have to like the Odegaard signing or the Ramsdale signing. You can love both. You can feel mediocre about either one. But I hope you love us because we definitely love you, and thank you for being here. And it's Chelsea at the weekend, and I have to breathe a heavy sigh given the fact that this would have been a weekend spent with actual real people in person in Las Vegas celebrating the start of the new season, but under the circumstances, maybe it's best that we're all apart from each other doing it hermetically sealed over a digital universe uh, where we exist these days. Tim's on Twitter. So, hello, Tim. Hello there. Pause on Twitter. Pause my pants. Hold pause. Woohoo. Woohoo. Indeed. So the window has slammed open my friends and uh, through that open window, has flown one Martin Odegaard and one Aaron Ramsdale, or at least they certainly seem to have. And I have to tell you, if we screw this up now, having decided to just record this as though it's happening, I'm going to be really, really furious. But let's take them in order, and we'll start with Martin Odegaard. It is a period, Tim, of fairly strong frustration with the club in some segments of the fan base, and I think it's fair to say that there's some concern, some despondency, some questions about what Edu does, whether Arteta is the right guy. And given all that, I think it is equally important to be intellectually consistent and give the club some freaking credit when they deserve it. Because I Mm -hmm. felt at the start of this window that it was a little naive to spend the whole summer chasing Martin Odegaard as their number one option, watching Buendia go, watching Awar sit there at 20 million euro, chasing James Madison for 60 million pounds. Is it the right price, the wrong price? The fact is, and we'll get into whether Odegaard is the right guy, he was their number one target, we believe. They have gotten him. And they have gotten him at a fee that for a 22-year-old, very, very highly regarded young prospect who has played for the Arsenal already, so should bet in pretty seamlessly, I think at least from a process standpoint, give them credit, right? I mean, if we're going to criticize when we get things wrong or do things that don't make sense, we should have the willingness to raise our hand and say, credit to them, they got this right. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I heard the conversation you guys had on the Patreon pod earlier this week, and I thought you kind of nailed it where there's two ways you can look at transfer business this summer. You can look at it from, do I like the players that we have lined up and bought? And, you know, can I see a strategy here? So, so for example, I mean, we'll talk about Ramsdale in a minute, I'm sure. Um, You know, putting aside how much you rate these players, we're pretty much getting our first choices and we're doing it without doing an awful lot of selling. So the the sale of Willock does seem to have unblocked things fairly significantly. I'd also argue that Burn Leno's performance against Brentford might have unlocked another signing um, pretty quickly. But but definitely, from a strategy standpoint, Arsenal are pretty much nailing their first choices and spending quite a lot of money in the process. Um, so I guess you have to give credit to Edu there. Um, right, because he's the guy we blame when we don't get who we want or we don't get out the door who we want. And and so, and so what this does, I think, is it gives Arteta no hiding place. He's been backed. He's been backed heavily. These are his guys, the guys that he really wanted. And the, the thing I'm quite interested in, I was looking at the Manchester United squad and I was looking at how Manchester United have kind of just improved incrementally over the last two years or so. Like us, they've made a lot of bad transfers, a lot of bad contracts, bad choices. But slowly, under Solskjaer, what they're doing is they're just upgrading their first 11. And they keep taking those points where they look weak. And you go, you look at them and you go, oh, but they haven't got a partner for Harry Maguire. Tick, Raphael Varane. And then you look at, you kind of look at them up front and you go, mm, yeah, maybe they, they miss a centre forward. Tick, Cavani. And then last season, you look at them and go, yeah, they're, they're good on the left. Not so good on the right, tick Sancho, and just every like with every weakness, they're just slowly bringing the quality of that first eleven up. And now you look at Manchester United, and really you just go, okay, they pro- they could probably do with an upgrade in defensive midfield. But that's really the only position. Like I just looked at their their team the other day or their squad, and I thought, oh, that's actually the only position where I think they're really weak. I swear, I the last time I looked at them, I thought they looked weak in several places. 
And so what Arsenal are doing here, you know, we've got a couple of squad signings done early. But, you know, that's the, this for me is going to be Erdgaard, Ben White, definitely for the starting eleven. Ramsdale for the starting eleven is just a case of how quickly that happens. I think that might happen quite quickly, um, to be honest. So it, it's, I think, in terms of, you know, strategy-wise, like Arteta's given them a list and Arsenal are pretty much hitting it. Um, but obviously, I think really the focus for the last kind of week and a half of the window, two weeks, is going to be getting guys out now. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I completely agree. Strategy standpoint, y- you can't really knock them from that from that uh, perspective. Yeah, I think I put I tend to put transfers into two categories, right? Do I like the process, <clears throat> and then do I like the talent identification? The latter. I can disagree with the club, but who the hell am I? <laughs> I'm just some guy who has an opinion about football and and can go to fbref.com and look at the green bars. Um, <clears throat> but like, so on the talent ID standpoint, I tend not to think that that's the one I'm going to get bent out of shape about. Like if I don't like the player, I don't like the player. If I like the player, I like the player. The process standpoint's where I get mad, right? Mm-hmm. Should you be buying Willian and putting him on a big wage at that age in that situation? You know, should you be re-signing Aubameyang? Should you be signing a Cedric? You know, those are those were process concerns in my view. I, I look at giving Shaq an extension is largely that too. Like for me, that would have been an area where moving on now makes sense. But setting that aside, whether you rate Ramsdale or Odegaard or Ben White or Lukaku, uh, Lukaku, that would be a hell of a signing. Uh, <laughs> Lukanga or Tavares, look what the club has done. They've gone young. They've gone, you know, I think other than white into a really interesting sort of price bracket where you're getting talent that's probably not just a a Hail Mary. You know, Ganduzi, Martinelli, those are Hail Marys. There's a little bit above that, certainly in Odegaard's case. And and now you've got a core with Saka and Martinelli and Smith Rowe and Lakanga and Tierney and Ben White and Gabriel, you know, and Ramsdale of guys who are going to move into their prime as one, essentially. You know, some stage of their prime, there thereabouts. Striker, right back, you know, maybe one more central midfielder. Yep, those areas still need to be addressed, but I think it's important to point out, if you thought this rebuild was going to happen in one window, you were setting yourself up for huge disappointment. It was too much to do in one window. And I think what we've done deserves credit. Now, whether you rate the, the players we've chosen, whether we got the talent ID right, that remains to be seen and, and will only be known over time. But, Paul, let's get to that side of it. And it's Martin Odegaard, and he's, he's a guy who is, you know, the, the new Messi at 16 years old. He, we are getting, I, I view this sort of like any of those really hugely hyped players who maybe went a little bit post-hype, but still can be very good, and as a result, you're getting them at a little bit of a discount. I think it says something in terms of Madrid's fear of getting burned on this that they required us to give them a right of first refusal to buy him back. If we, if we sell them in the future. They don't want to look back on this and, and see this as a huge mistake that they made. So I like the player. I think there is an open debate about whether he really makes us better or not. A lot of people would say, well, he was in our first 11 last season. Other people would say, yeah, and during that period, we were roughly the third or fourth best team in the league. Where do you stand on the extent to which Odegaard is both the right player and moves the needle in terms of where we need to get to next? Well, our biggest problem is in the attacking third, and our related problem to that is once we get the ball into the attacking third, be it through Kieran Tierney or any other method, uh, getting it to an actual striker in the box. And Odegaard, I think, is the answer to that problem. He's the guy who puts his foot on the ball, metaphorically, uh, looks where the players are and connects them in two, three chess moves and makes the choices as to when you switch it to the other side of the pitch, when you bring it back, when he asks for it, what to do in that right-hand corner with Pepe and overlapping fullback, uh, be it Bellerin or Chambers. Uh, We saw him last year pointing, moving people around, getting the triangle working in that corner. Uh, He patrols from the left wing to the center of the pitch, and he really doesn't stray into the other half, but that's okay. We've got the Kieran Tierney show on that side and probably Smith Rowe. So there's just a, an excellent balance between Smith Rowe and Odegaard. And we've seen, we love Smith Rowe. He's been brilliant. Gareth Southgate has watched him against Brentford, and one player that absolutely popped when the rest of the team didn't, was Smith-Rowe. So I think he'll get his England call up very soon. 
and we'll have potentially a very functioning left-hand side with, I hope, a, tier, a tierney Smithrow combo over there, uh, wh- wherever Smithrow starts from, be it left wing or kind of more of an attacking eight kind of thing, if we can absorb that in our formation. And on the right, Odegaard pulls the strings and in a sense pulls the strings for the left-hand side too, because he'll send it that way when it's time. And when a team's in a, a deep block, he's going to be the guy who picks that pass. Um, he's a really good dribbler, but his dribbles are always to beat one man because that man was between him and the pass he wanted to make to the player he wanted to get to just ahead of him. Uh, he's visionary. He's always scanning. He's going to. W- we saw that clip and that photo of uh, Chaka not making the pass to Martinelli that was shared on Twitter, which, as I argued, was a little harsh on Chaka, but still valid. He that is the kind of pass that only certain players will make in the final third. And and Smithrow is great, makes lots of clever passes, but he's not quite the head up, foot on the ball. Um, my my pretentious term of the week, la pausa, the slowing it down till you see the option or, or, or jiggling the defense a little bit with a move to one side or the other till the passing lane, the option till the player makes the move. That's Odegaard. And we don't have that. We don't have the chill, the foot on the ball, the guy who pulls the strings, and we're not connecting to our very expensive center forwards and we have two of them, and they're talented, and they look crap at the moment because the ball doesn't get to them. Mm. Well, you and I rewatched this game yesterday, uh, mm-hmm. this Brentford game, with Clive. By the way, if you want Clive's views on uh, the Odegaard signing, uh, we did a rewatch for patrons, Paul, Clive, and I, and it's video, and there's an audio version, and the first 25 minutes or so is a reaction to the Odegaard news, so you can you can uh, check that out if you want to, Clive, uh, due to some technical difficulties and hardware that needs to be corrected and wouldn't be available for today. Can't can't join us today, but he will. In his microphone, he's not like a cyber bot or something. No, uh, he is actually the the oh, chip okay. in his the chip in his brain that prevents him from going like full Elliot and just melting down about things broke, and so now all he's doing is just screaming into the void. So we're getting that corrected so that he can be back to his nice, hmm. uh, usual calm and and rational self. I think what we should do though, uh, well, let's. Let's finish up the Odegaard conversation because as we're recording this, some news is breaking about the team that we're going to want to discuss. So we'll we'll introduce that in a moment and then we'll get to Ramsdale. But Tim, just really quickly for the Odegaard thing for me, I think he's a very, very talented young player. I think people forget how much players can improve from 22 years old if they have the technical level. And I don't think there's any doubt that he has the technical level. Maybe put on a little bit of, of muscle, right? Add some strength. He, he has all the technical qualities necessary, maybe learn his positioning a little bit better so he doesn't always get drawn to the ball or always just occupy that same half space. But I, I think he's a really dangerous player. There are people that sort of, I think, take the attitude about a transfer that if big club X no longer wants the player or big club Y didn't come in for the player, then the player's not good. And I just think we have way too many examples of that not being the case. So, so many of them. And especially at a young age, and there's lots of players that have come to Arsenal who no other big club wanted, who went on to be legends for the club. So I, I don't find that compelling. You can certainly speak to that if you want, but I think the thing that I'm more concerned about is having rewatched the Brentford game, Tim, Emil Smith Rowe is just continuing to look like a revelation for me. And even though that game wasn't great, everything great about it was mostly him. I love the way he's playing that position. And I am curious about how Odegaard's reintroduction will influence that because what we saw last season is it meant that Smith Rowe plays out on the left a bit. Drifting centrally, but left. It also means one less spot for picking from, you know, Pepe, Martinelli, Saka. And I think we believe that Saka is probably first in the heart of Mikel Arteta. So what's your feeling about Odegaard rejoining in terms of sort of not necessarily taking a position away from Smith Rowe, but adjusting what Smith Rowe has been doing quite effectively, and then the the knock on effect for those other players I mentioned? I, I think it makes perfect sense. I really like um, the kind of the three of Saka, Erdegaard, um and Smith Rowe. I, th- I think that's a really nice balance, particularly behind a Bamiyang. And look, it is impossible for me to imagine Arsenal having a good season with a Bamiyang having a season like he had last year. We're, we're talking about elite talent, right? That that's an elite talent we've got in the bank. We know it's an elite talent. Um, And one of the best ways we can try and get up the league and up the table is by unlocking it. 
And I think having those three, um, and look, they're not going to play all 38 games, obviously, but I, I think having those three behind him potentially really unlocks that. I, I really like Smith Rowe, wide left. I mean, like you say, he, he comes in field really and plays as a dual 10. I do think every team needs um, two players like that. I think it's very, very rare that a good team just has a number 10 who does everything creatively. Like I don't think that works. Even in like the Fabregas days, that didn't happen. He had Kleb, he had Rosicki, players like that. Um, ditto Invincibles, you know, Bergkamp, Henri, Perez. Like you need more than one. And I, I really like that kind of balance of Smith Rowe and Odegaard. I think it creates a really nice symmetry as well. Because if you kind of put Smith Rowe over on the left, but you know, drifting around as a bit of a left 10, and Erdegaard goes over to the right as a bit of a right 10. I think that gives Arsenal a little bit of um, a little bit better symmetry because we all saw what happened against Brentford. It was it was parody. It was all we had was the left hand side. Um and and you know, Smith Rowe played in that game and he played well, but he's only one player. Um and and look, you saw how much better Arsenal looked when Saka came on as well. I, I wouldn't call Saka a creator as such, but he has a form of creativity in the way that he carries the ball and helps us to get it to the edge of the area. Just think of God's a slightly different type. You know, you know, as Paul said, he's he's more of a you're kind of more, I guess, traditional ten. But but I really like the signing for a lot of soft factor reasons as well. So I like the player. I think there's elite potential there. I really do. I think he was really good. But I think there's room for more and for him to push those kind of end product numbers up as well. And the reason I like the soft factor side of it, like you say, he's 22. He hasn't quite caught fire in the way that people thought when he was 16. Um, he's, you know, he's been good. He's had a couple of good loan spells. But the thing is, he spent six months at Arsenal and he wanted to come back. And I think it's a really good sign when a player wants to join you, isn't just joining you because they're like, oh God, I've, I've just got to get out of where I am. Like he could have gone to another club. There would have been interest. He wanted to come back to Arsenal. Uh, and I, I think, think it's interesting to me. Like he agreed his personal terms in about five minutes, right? Yeah, 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 <laughs> so. exactly. Like he, he wants this move, I think. I think just as a sidebar, one of the interesting things about this summer that there have been no like bidding wars over any player, like even the big transfers that have happened. Like no one else was in for Lukaku. Um, no one else came in for Joe Willock. Um, even I, I think that's just quite interesting. But but you know he's twenty. 20- I would not overestimate or underestimate Tim the extent to which there are very 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 few clubs with any money. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, no, that's that's obviously it. Um, but, you know, Odegaard, he's 22. He's had quite a nomadic existence at Real Madrid. He wasn't really trusted there. He's had a couple of good loan spells. This really looks to me like he's thinking, right, I'm 22 now. My career, it, it hasn't quite drifted, but, I, you know, I know I'm a good player and I want to show it. And he's gone somewhere where he can be an important player. He's signed a five-year contract. So that's showing some faith in this, you know, quote-unquote project. And I just, I just really, I've just got a really good feeling that he's going to think, right, th- these are like my kind of early prime years coming up and I'm not fucking about anymore. The gloves are off. I've told Madrid to fuck off. I'm not, I'm not interested in this. Oh, well, if you impress us, like I just want to go somewhere and be a good player. And I really think that there's, you know, there, there is a little bit maybe of a leap of faith on Arsenal's side to realize some of that potential. But I think the, I think, um, I think the ingredients are there for it. I really do. Mm. So, Paul, as a last thought here, I mean, do you do you worry at? All? I mean, look, every time I say the word "worry," someone taps the whiskers mug. I get it, but like, there is a hell of a cluster of talented young players vying for sort of similar zones of the pitch, if not exact positions. Mm. Odegaard makes us better. He makes us deeper at those positions and creates more competition that inevitably is going to mean a season full of people going, why isn't the player I like starting? <laughs> so, yeah. and by the way, that, that is the voice I will use when I say that throughout the season. So can you explain to me which of the players I like won't be starting and why? <laughs> um, well, I'm with Tim on who the ideal four is. Uh, I think I said that the, the last time we talked on it. Smithrow, uh, Odegaard at the 10, Smithrow on the left, Aubameyang or Lacazette, and uh, on the right, uh, Saka, obviously. And we need a bit of rotation. We need people who come out after 60, 70 minutes, as, as somebody said, probably Tim. 
Uh, this could be a great season for Martinelli coming off the bench for 30 minutes and running at tired legs. And it it not only it creates the opportunity for competition too, not just to play well, but for end product because the guys who are going to stay on the pitch are the guys who get get goals and assists because we can't faff around. So uh, there's there's uh, competition for how you fit into the team, and then there's going to be the competition to actually get that stupid ball in the back of the net. Um, and we're front loaded on the on the front of the pitch, and yeah, that's a problem. We've got too many good players, which is great, but we're trying to get into Europe, and next year that's a problem that gets solved real quick if we get into Europa or um, uh, Inshallah, uh, the top four. So uh, it's a self solving problem if we go in the right direction, and if we don't go in the right direction, we got other problems anyway. Uh, the one thing I wanted to add to the conversation, I don't want to get into the big uh, conversation on, well, Real Madrid let him go. So what does that mean? I, I did see a tweet, something about the Odegaard camp. Think he's actually a much much more of a Barcelona player than a Madrid player, and uh, I think they probably want to address the kind of you know, did he not make it here kind of thing. And that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, uh, he doesn't really look like any of the midfielders you think of at Real Madrid. He doesn't quite have that mobility, that athleticism, that play anywhere on the pitch. You know where this guy plays. He's a version of a 10, and he wants to be in that pocket that a really good 4-2-3-1 kind of team like a Barcelona of old would have played And, you know, would he have nailed down a place at Barcelona? Not many would. But uh, I think he was always going to be challenged at Real Madrid. Uh, I I like him. I think Tim's right on all the soft factors. Um, Real Madrid don't pay pay their side players nearly as good, especially a guy who's been on loan. So the other thing on the squad building and the process – Everybody we brought in, you could see that they come in on a very reasonable wage structure. So we've, within the space of a few windows and a couple of seasons, we we're going to have a lineup that looks nothing like it did two years ago, and a wage structure that we have optionality. We may be able to move players on in the future, God forbid. Um, and while they're here, we have the chance to have a sensible wage structure because everything's changing in football. And we've gone to younger players who've come in who will look at our our uh, leaner times uh, wage structure and say, that's still very attractive. I mean, I think Odegaard, we paid his loan wages uh, last January and it was something like reported as 38K per week. I mean, that's that's nothing for us. So... We can bring him in on a, a wage. This is why I think his personal terms might have been really quick. We can bring him in on a big bump on that and say, and you can have a lot more when you prove yourself. But he, he'll look at it and say, hey, shit, I'm getting paid twice as much or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and and get his his career back off on on the direction it needs to go because yeah, I don't think you want to be one of these sort of permanently out on loan players. It just seems like good advice for the player, good and good move by the club. I think he's a very, very good player. I still wonder if he's an end product player. I mean, he's proven, you know, expected mm-hmm. threat and all these sort of advanced metrics that talk about the degree to which a player contributes that sort of intermediate value stuff that leads towards potentially high value stuff he's great at. He now needs to be a goals and assist guy. So does Smith Rowe, so does Saka. I mean, so does Pepe. You know, if we play Smith Rowe, Odegaard, Saka uh, in, in the three around Aubameyang, none of them have any really proven end product yet. So they all need to add it. And that that is really the question. Whenever you get a young player that looks really bright, looks really good, flashes a little end product, the next step is to go to that next level up in end product. And some make it and some don't. And we need at least a couple of them to show they can do it. So he may go into the side this weekend. I guess there's a work permit issue. We'll see. He makes us better. We were better when he was here last season. I like the signing. I don't know that you want to put it in the category of a solves everything signing. I mean, look, there were certain signings that when we made them, they were absolutely transformational overnight. The last one I can think of like that, I think is Alexis Sanchez. I wouldn't even put Aubameyang into that category, but Alexis, we were a different animal the day after he arrived because he's a different animal to be fair. And that force of nature player, Clive and I talked about this might've been on a, on a Patreon pod, but 
we do sort of miss that force of nature player. I think Pepe, there was a hope that's what he would be. All dribbling, all shooting, all attacking the box all the time. I don't know personality-wise or talent-wise or consistency-wise if he has that. Martinelli maybe develops into that. He's not that yet. We certainly saw he doesn't have the personality to do that You know, he, against Brentford. Very, very passive, very uh, peripheral. I like Odegaard. Technical, clean, nice player. But who's going to be that Robin Van Persie? Who's going to be that Alexis Sanchez? Who's going to be that force of nature player who just devastates opposition and makes us a totally different, a totally different prospect to handle? Um, I still think that has to be solved. And maybe it will be Aubameyang again. I mean, maybe it's not fair to put him not into that category because of how many goals he scored. Uh, so we'll see. And and that leads us into the next conversation, which is the breaking news. Team news is out. Tim. It turns out we had a COVID breakout uh, in the team. Yep. Aubameyang, Lacazette, Willian, Runnerson. <laughs> I feel like they just wanted an excuse for him not being around, and so they said he had COVID too. Run I'm kidding. Nose Runnerson. Yeah, ru- Runner Nose run, run Noserson. Runner um, Noserson. Look, there's there's some, and I want to be clear about saying, you know, last season I made what is probably a, a pretty poor miscalculation saying I didn't believe the news of Aubameyang having the flu. It just didn't seem to add up. Now, I mean, he had malaria. It's not the flu, but the point is he was sick. This time around, it seemed pretty clear to me. We're in a global pandemic. Players are mixing with each other now. The bubbles are gone. There's going to be COVID. There just is. And this seemed like COVID, and it was COVID. Now, the good news is Aubameyang is in line to potentially play this weekend. Lacazette is not. I'm not sort of sure why one would be different than the other, except if maybe, you know, I guess players heal different. People what, are different. What was different. that, sorry? Severi- yeah, diff- severity. They've, they've yeah. said... Um, in the press release that Aubameyang's basically he's tested negative he's kind of feeling fine whereas Lacazette's still recovering I said there you go well so, so often the answer is as straightforward as simply reading through the press release that came out while we were recording this podcast so I know what you guys have been up to so uh, what I would say though is that it, it's good news that this means that sort of the worst case conspiracy scenarios are not coming to fruition it's good news because we may have Aubameyang for the weekend which I think with all due respect to Balogun, where he is in his development, this is a, a, a good thing. In terms of maybe behind-the-scenes stuff, I'm curious if you have any thoughts. There's some rumors that this came about as a result of you know groups of players getting together and partying. I don't know how you handle this. I mean, it's easy to kind of go in at your own players for misbehaving, but players are young, they're rich. You know, when you have late 20, early 30-year-old millionaires, and you know they're not at training, they want to live their life. It's really, really hard to keep them in a bubble for one season, let alone two. So I maybe have a little sympathy, but at the same time, rules are rules. I don't know. I'm I'm glad that the news is that Aubameyang might be back. I'm sad to hear that they had COVID, but I, it certainly sounds like they're all fine. Do you have any sort of takeaways beyond the surface level of the news in terms of any of the rumor of partying behind the scenes or the, the way the sort of more senior players are behaving? Not really. I mean, in the UK, all restrictions have dropped. Um, now, so that there is no real rule break. That there are no real rules around it. So there's no rule breaking. Um, I think I saw someone say that, like I don't know if it's like a Bamiyang's son's birthday party or something like that. I don't know. Um, I I'd be surprised if Runison, Willian, Bamiyang, and Lacazette were all great mates, but I don't really know. Um, but what? But I, you know, I said on the last podcast, and you probably heard the tentativeness in my voice um, because I was told about this on Friday afternoon before the game that the Brentford game came into some doubt um, because of this. So I, I don't think I'd have believed any conspiracy theories around it anyway because that just seems to happen every time someone gets injured now, particularly when you're still in the transfer window. Someone gets injured and everyone goes, "Oh, they're leaving." Um, Especially if it's a player that some people would like to wish away, you know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, So, I mean, no, not really. I mean, this is the thing, like all restrictions are dropped. So there's a spike in cases at the moment. That's that's literally the way it works. And, um, you know, people aren't in bubbles anymore, generally speaking, and people are kind of out there and and living their lives. And and therefore, um, you know, more people are going to get it. Like the, the kind of, sad truth about this virus is everyone is going to get it um at some stage it's, it's not going away so yeah um it's I, I i don't really have any kind of opinion on any you know any like you know ab- about their social activities that might have led them to get this and and like honestly like lots more like 
most players are going to be out for at least a game or two this season because they have COVID. That's just that's just the nature of it. And clubs are going to have to be, just like workplaces, are going to have to be ultra cautious um, about this. You know, if you work in an office, you will be told if you've got the sniffles, we don't care if you, if if it's COVID or not. Don't come in. Stay away. That's that's just going to be the way of the world. Um, while this kind of transitions from pandemic to endemic, so I, I definitely would have loved have. this, wouldn't he? <laughs> yes, <laughs> boss. I think I got the sniffles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stay away. Um, so, I, like, I definitely no value judgments. I, you know, I just think it's one of those things. It's going to happen plenty more. Yeah. So then, I mean, I I agree. I fully agree. I, I think we're in a pandemic. We're in the second stage of it now, where people are mixing and life is sort of returning back to normal. Whatever your take on whether that's how it should be going or not going, uh, Timmy said it best. It's gone from pandemic to endemic. It's here to stay. And it's just going to be a part of life. And, you know, out for two weeks with a positive COVID test is going to be the new 14 days with a hamstring twinge, you know, so or 21 days. So I think we're just going to learn to live with that. The The problem is <laughs> this hamstring twinge can get other people to have their hamstring twinge, if you follow yeah, what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and where it becomes a problem is what happens when it's eight players, when it's 10 players in a team. Mm-hmm. The Brentford preparations were obviously massively disrupted by this. Now, we're lucky that we have dead weight like Runnerson and William, where it doesn't affect us when they're out. But that could have been four really important players. As it is, it was two. Maybe so, that's why we have them, a cordon of herd immunity with <laughs> Runnerson and the William. Human shields. The human break. shield. What's the opposite yeah. of a cordon sanitaire? <laughs> uh, cordon unsanitary. <laughs> I'm yeah, going to go yeah. in for 500. Um, so, so Paul, the good news though is that Oba may be back, and and I don't know how fit he will be. I mean, I don't think he was sick, sick. So I assume he could still be doing sort of like light running and personal training or whatnot. I, I don't know what the protocol would be there. I got to believe they're going to get him in the team if they can. So, just in terms of now with this news coming out, what would you expect as a as a team for Sunday? And uh, do you think Aubameyang will be in it? Uh, yeah. I mean, our choices are, uh, like, I think he's got to go in ahead of Balogun. There's no ifs, ands, and buts. I guess we could play a, a false 90 kind of thing with uh, Smith Rowe or something, give that another go, find somebody else to to sit in that spot um, on the basis that we might not get a lot of shots. Um, I mean, I, I think it'd have to be Pepe, right? It can't be Balogun again, so maybe yeah. Pepe. Yeah, maybe. I mean, uh, I don't know. I think it's going to be Aubameyang is is the safest bet, and after you know the number two option of that is may. I mean, at least Balogun's an actual centre forward doing centre forwardy things. Um, I'd still think that's probably the sequence of, and then number three is a n other giving it a go. Um, w- when we played Chelsea last time. I think we had a back three and they kept us deep and we stayed deep. So like guessing what our lineup is going to be this weekend, I have no clue. But Ob- I think the safest bet is, yes, we're going to play with Aubameyang. Hope they screw up at the back again and Smith Rowe and himself can, can combine to weasel a goal in there because if uh, we don't score first, we're we're in trouble and we're probably in trouble anyway. So, uh, But hopefully the energy of the crowd and all that kind of stuff the Brentford effect kicks in and we have the energy to see this through, but it's going to be a tough game. I mean, uh, Chelsea aren't less good than the last time we saw them. Uh, They might even be a little bit gooder. And uh, with the Lukaku option, whether he starts or or comes in a little later on, they'll have the verticals that they maybe didn't have before if they have a lot of possession and a lot of corners. Not that that's all of his game by any means, but... We're going to have a very challenging time, and um, I guess uh, I'm I'm offering S- Sunday up to God as a sacrifice, <laughs> <laughs> Some kind of religious sacrifice to strengthen the re- uh, kind of our virgins delivered to the gods uh, to deliver us a better uh, season from there on in. I, I think we're <laughs> I think it could be uh, could be brutal watching. Yeah, I mean the, the, the interesting thing with Chelsea is. They haven't been that devastating an attacking team they, under no. Tuchel. They've been a very, very effective defensive team. Yep. And so this could be, I mean, not the best watch for the neutral. <laughs> if, Paul, if your take after Brentford was that was 
fecking brilliant. This could be my, not my, fecking brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and just for context, I was just talking about football back, about the bittersweet, like – uh, I was bruised by that, and yet I saw a few players who stood up and made my heart swell, and Smith Rowe and Lakonga and Tierney and Saka when he came back. Uh, like, I had this kick in the gut from the Brentford result, but my senses were just, like, pumping from a fucking football game going through my ears where the ca- crowd gave it everything. And I hope I see we see that at the Emirates. That that's what that was the fucking brilliant part of the game. <laughs> yeah, not the outcome. No, uh, that, no. that's for sure. No. Fair enough. Well, you know what is fantastic is being able to watch all the games you love, and that's right. The summer of soccer continues on Paramount Plus. Stream over two thousand soccer matches a year from around the world. That's all the heart pounding drama from CBS Sports, including. Wait to hear about these. UEFA Champions League, Europa League, Italy's Serie A, Argentina's Primera División, the Brasileiro, right, Tim? NWSL, the Asian Football Confederation, and the CONCACAF qualifiers featuring the stars from the U.S. and Mexican men's national teams. Plus, much more. It's the best of the beautiful game with all the beautiful names like Messi, Mbappe, Ronaldo, Rapino, and it says here Pulisic. I apologize. Be part of the excitement as champions are crowned and history is made. And eventually for Arsenal as well. We'll get back there. The world's game lives here on Paramount+. Plus. Visit ParamountPlus.com to start your free trial and stream every match live. Tim, speaking of someone who is alive, Aaron Ramsdale is alive. Yes. And so are the rumors of him joining. That's yes. a segue. This, this is a tough one. I think the Aaron Ramsdale transfer, when it first broke as news, everyone had sort of the same vomit emoji reaction. And over time, I think what has happened is that some people have sort of uh, dug their heels in and continue to vomit emoji. And some people have, you know, done, I think, the exact opposite, which like really talked themselves into it. And then I find myself sort of in the middle of that spectrum, which is the ultimate price we seem to settle on seems not quite so terrible for a young English keeper who is pretty highly regarded despite, you know, some (laughs) obvious goals conceded issues and relegation issues, which some of which is his fault and some not. I am, I am of the opinion that we need a goalkeeper. And if this is the guy they really believe solves the problem, a guy of his age, who's English and homegrown, a big fee had been paid for him him to go to Sheffield. It wasn't going to be cheap to get him Sheffield United, I should say, so I don't upset people. I can get maybe not all the way to liking this, but I can get pretty close to justifying it. I definitely am no longer in the vomit emoji range. I think in a moment I'll explain to you where my concerns lie, but mm-hmm. on the range of our initial reaction being revulsion to you know now just embracing it with open arms, where are you on that spectrum? Yeah, sure. So first things first, I should say it's uh, Brazil around. <laughs> it's- one, more, one more time? Brazil around. Brazil Rao. You want you yes. know what's funny? That ad copy comes with pronunciation keys, and that's not what the pronunciation yeah. key says. Well, Portuguese so I, I'm going is, to, a, is a very nasally language, says so a Brazil Rao. Well, um, I, I'm going to write a strongly worded email. <laughs> okay, go for it. Yeah, sure. So with with Ramsdale, yeah, I, I've probably moved somewhere into the middle here as well because at first I was kind of like, really, I didn't, but but then I thought about it because yeah. Because my initial honest reaction was really okay. I'm I I not sure he's that good, but I haven't seen that much of him, or at least I haven't really concentrated that much when he's been playing. And then you know you see the the reaction online is what this guy's rubbish, and that wasn't my initial reaction. My my reaction wasn't a million miles away from that. I'll be honest, like, but my my honest reaction was i haven't seen that much of him but he's i i don't think he's impressed me when i have um so like my stance on this is i'm i'm just going to be completely objective about it i don't know much about this goalkeeper i haven't seen him that much so i'm i'm completely open minded about it um you know i i never kind of thought mm, i wonder if he's a 30 million pounds goalkeeper but um, I, you know, I repeat, I, I don't really know enough. I think one thing that maybe I wouldn't say I've talked myself into, but it's just a general wondering I have. You know, we talked about a little bit about the kind of the passing out. Is he, you know, is he really like an Arteta goalkeeper? 
And, uh, you know, referencing the number of long balls that he played at Sheffield United, obviously, because that's their style. And he didn't do that at Bournemouth because that's that's not their style. But it made me wonder, actually, whether some of his long kicking is kind of the point um, and whether actually that's seen as a real strength in terms of his distribution, because Leno can't really do that. Leno can't really put his white light. He does that clip um, kind of pass, but he doesn't he doesn't get an awful lot of distance on it and I do wonder if Arteta's thinking actually his long passing is something we quite like I mean he bought Ben White right and and one of the reasons was he's quite good at those kind of big diagonals so why would why why would that be any less desirable from a guy who stood 10 yards behind him so that that's just a guess on my part I don't know but um and let's not you know do ourselves a disservice by comparing him to Edison or anything like that. But, you know, Edison's long distribution is the point, right? That's why Man City got him, not because he's good at finding the fullback. They got him because he's good at finding the centre forward. Um, and I'm not suggesting for one second that Ramsdale will be that revelate revelatory. And I'm sure that if there is a goalkeeper out there with Edison's distribution, he's not available to us at any price. So I do wonder a bit whether there's something they've seen in his long distribution that they like. And, you know, I from what I've read and seen, he's not bad at short passing, but then short passing's kind of easy, to be honest. So I'd expect most goalkeepers to be able to do that in this day and age. Um, particularly ones of, of, you know, particularly any goalkeeper under 30 should be able to pass the ball 20 yards like the, the back pass law came in nearly 30 years ago now. So like a lot of these guys weren't alive in an era where you got to pick the ball up and just welly it up the pitch um, out of your hands. So um, yeah, I, that, that's that's just like a general wondering I have. But but really on, on Ramsdale, I'm open-minded. Um, this is clearly the guy that Arsenal really wanted. They've gone and got him. I do think that Leno's... Um, fairly indifferent performances in pre-season and again against Brentford have brought them back to the negotiating table. I think this is probably a win for Sheffield United um, in terms of holding out and then seeing Leno be a bit crap and look a little bit like he's checked out um, and then Arsenal yeah. kind of come back with closer to the price they want. But, you know, it is what it is. If, if, the, if this is the guy they want, then like I say, I'm open-minded about it. Yeah, again, if we go back to the beginning and say there are two types of mistakes, one is the error of process and the other is error of talent identification, the latter is totally understandable. You're not going to get every talent ID right. The former is less acceptable. Well, this is a young English keeper, homegrown, right? The fee isn't outrageous, although it's on the large side. The age is good, and it's a position that we eventually need to address. So process-wise, I think it's okay. You know, Paul, the, the funny thing for me is I don't know how you tell who's a good keeper and who isn't. My view of keepers is 95% of them are pretty much the same. They'll save the same shots. They'll get to the same crosses. They'll make the same passes. I love 5% you. of them really are dog shit. Yeah. 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 5% 5 of them are, are dog shit. Are runnerson, right? Are, are a joke. Or not necessarily that bad, but are more in the Ospina category of like, they have a real flaw, like standing behind the line to try to stop things. Uh, and then 5% of them are in that super elite category where they can Cruyff turn, dribble out, you know, play the ball on a six pence, you know, three quarters of the pitch to, to the striker, stop everything. Okay. Outside of that top 5% and that bottom 5%, I don't know how you really distinguish the other ones. I think it's really tricky. The data certainly isn't convincing. You know, Giant Gunner, who, who I love, did a uh, data review of Ramsdale in the Discord, and he's got access to some non-public data, and it's a little better, but I still don't think it tells you everything. And so it does boil down to the fact that it's odd that as the team that plays out from the back more than any other team in the league, we picked a guy who played long more than any other keeper in the league. That's not to say we don't have some other earlier uh, information about how he can pass, but we certainly don't have a guy, like in the last season, this is a guy who didn't play short, and now he's going to have to come learn it. Now the good news is, I don't think he has to step in and be the one right away, although with Leno's form and attitude, maybe that's going to change quicker. I think the thing for me is more opportunity cost Ben White, good player, young player, talented player, homegrown. The fee might be a little on the high side. Overall, not a bad buy. Same with Ramsdale. If you told me we were going to spend in the range of 80 million pounds this summer on keeper and center and center back, I think I would have been a bit incredulous at that. And especially if you told me that the Shaka replacement was Shaka <laughs> and that there's no right back or no striker coming in, I would have said, 
Could we have used that 80 million pounds differently? So do you see where I'm going, Paul? I mm-hmm. can kind of sort of get to the point where it, Ramsdale doesn't bother me because on the metrics, the age, the talent level, the price, like there, a, a lot of that feels okay. And yet it feels like this is a summer where maybe we went a little bigger than we needed to in ways that don't necessarily strengthen the team as much as we could have. So when you look at Ramsdale, how much is your of your opinion is informed by the player himself and how much is just informed by how we've kind of opted to allocate our resources? Um, wow, there's a lot in that when, when you look at it. So uh, like th- this is just a, a theory that I think is probably incorrect, but... <laughs> <laughs> but, but he did warn you, everybody. Just so, just when he's yeah. done, he warned you. <laughs> it, it almost feels like the keeper decision is uh, like it's one for the manager and then one for the. I'll use the term director of football. I don't necessarily mean Edu. I just mean that the apparatus of Arsenal that's doing forward planning. I almost feel like Ramsdale is the forward planning one. Uh, now maybe it's it's Arteta saying I need this and I need this now, um, but. I don't know why we're doing it this season instead of next season. We got two years on Leno, but we are. So we obviously think it's a priority. I'm sure the Cronkies don't want to spend 24 million that they didn't have to spend when they didn't want to. Um, so, like Arteta may have serious con- concerns with Leno, or this is part of a bigger picture where we're looking at a transition of the squad, and this was the time to get in a young English keeper um at like i know we're concerned about the price of this goalkeeper and stuff but every player we buy is 20 something million i mean lakonga like we we get really worked up about 24 million for a goalkeeper right lakonga was 17 million he's 21 and almost nobody'd ever heard of him um i don't i think we get worked up about the 24 million for a keeper and I think that's the wrong part of the problem to worry about. I was actually shitting myself after Brentford that both Odegaard and uh, Ramsdale were going to shoot up 10, 15 million uh, in the negotiating process. And I'm amazed we're, that the numbers coming back are actually fairly reasonable. It's almost like we won Brentford and Real Madrid and uh, Sheffield United came scurrying back to us and said, ah, actually, we'll give you a really good deal on both those guys. Um, we feel bad for you. You need these players. Here, yeah. <laughs> take them. <laughs> <laughs> this was not the... I thought it was going to get ugly. And in fact, it got quick. It got simple. They did the deals. They're at better uh, fees than were being rumored by a long way. And I think they're, in both cases, at pretty reasonable fees. The, uh, I'm with you both on, like, it's really hard to assess keepers. Um, I watched, I like, I'm at probably our one expert on this. I actually went and watched three games of Aaron Ramsdale. And I can tell you, if there's something more boring than watching centre-backs playing games, it's goalkeepers. Not much happened. He looked to be quite good. I think the major feature that we assess goalkeepers on is do they scare us? You know, like Adrian Clark in the breakdown, um, like sometimes he has that slightly, his hair is a little tussled and he has that slightly crazy look about him. Have you noticed that? Nope, not at all. <laughs> Always really? looks like a very sane and composed man to me. <laughs> Generally is, but he's got a, like a little bit of the crazy about him. And then you look at somebody like an Almunia who always looks like he's uh, reasonably close to crazy. And it, it's like, it's that uh, anxiety it creates in fans and maybe even in the back line and in the players themselves. And the one concern I have with Ramsdale is not that there's something dodgy about him. He just has a slight look of the slightly crazy around the eyes of him. The, the kind of the vibe is a slight lack of chill. He's very Paul, quick. The the quote I heard from a Sheffield United fan is he has an unfortunate relationship with calamity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't know how I don't know that that actually pan- like I think that's the reaction fans have to certain keepers who make them feel uneasy as opposed to the reality of it. Um so we'll see over time. Like keepers are like for me like have you ever read any of that research about or like the analysis about when they're supposed to come out, when they're supposed to spread themselves, when they're supposed to stay up star shaped and stuff. And I think I'm getting the hang of it. And then I watch a game and like, I have no clue. It's like when they tell you what to do with bears, right? 
a grizzly. Is that the one where I lie down and play dead while he's tearing my arm off? Or is that maybe make ground, yourself big and run yeah, at him, run up a tree like polar bears. They look, they don't look dangerous or whatever, but apparently those are vicious killers. Panda bears, like they eat bamboo shoots. Am I safe with that? Like with keepers, I don't know how to assess them. They are. Do you want like, to know something, Paul? Yeah. Panda bears aren't bears. Ah, <laughs> and, and neither is Runnerson. <laughs> He's not a keeper. Yeah. <laughs> um, can, I don't. Can we move I, on? <laughs> yeah, I look with keepers of all the positions. We got to hope they know what they're doing. The only people who can assess keepers are goalkeeper analysts and experts, or you've watched them a long time and you've a really good like. It's just really hard. I like Tim's theory about the distribution, though. I think that's quite clever because you mm. like and like we do launch them off the free off uh, kickouts. We we play it short from the back in open play, but. We, we basically haven't been playing it out from the back from kickoff. So uh, it's not all bad. Mm. Some people speculate that pandas belong in the raccoon classification. Oh, so if, if you see a panda bear rummaging around your garbage <laughs> <laughs> late at night, just let him go. He's, he's, he's com- communing yeah. with nature. Um, Tim, the one issue is that like this, I think the reason this scares some people is it is in the range of outcomes that, that Aaron Ramsdale's terrible. I'm not saying he is. That's not my point. I'm saying it's it that. Happened. And you could say that's in every range of outcomes for every when signing. When did but, you stop beating your wife? That's, that's <laughs> well, basically yeah, right. what you did that, there. That's an it incriminating question. Uh, well, what I mean is, I mean, he's conceded an absolute mountain of goals. Every team he goes to gets relegated. And I'm not saying that's his fault. He's never played the ball short, or I shouldn't say never. In the last season, he, he played it long more than anybody else. Like, I think where I worry with the White and Ramsdale thing is, it's a lot of money on speculation that isn't that doesn't feel super safe. Like Ben White, very good young player, never really played in a true back four, always had kind of a hybrid role. Now he's the anchor of our central defense. Aaron Ramsdale has conceded a mountain of goals, not been someone who's played short, played for teams where he's very active, constantly having to make saves. I think that's another big change we should bear in mind. Keepers coming from very active environments to environments where they spend the whole game mostly watching or just passing the ball and and only have to make saves in certain occasions like these are big changes so do you do you have any concern that maybe we've just that the risk profile on this is maybe just a little more than it should be like you can have some sympathy for the people who just look at the amount of goals the guys conceded and said really this guy <laughs> yeah 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 absolutely and um and you know they're all quite young aren't they and we're all very excited about the team getting younger but but that will come with you know with pitfalls as well and and players' careers aren't always linear. Um, yeah, I, I think that is absolutely in in the range of outcomes uh, with with like Ben White and Aaron Ramsdale, for example. Like are these like effectively these are the guys that are going to be leading the defence. Um, not least because Tin is not re- well. I say Tin is not a defender, but do you know what I mean. Like really, it's a back through. Like you look at the yeah. average position yep. charts. Tin is not a defender. Um, yeah, he's a winger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Wh- which is fine. Like that's not a criticism of him. That's the thing we want him doing. Um, and you know, and 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 that's why I like the right back signing uh, when it happens. I suspect that won't be this window. Will be will be very very important. But you kind of look at White, Gabriel, Chambers, Ramsdale. Like you know, that's 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 a defense that doesn't say to me like that they're like at least with um, with David Luiz. Um, we know that David Luiz. Um, has his moments, but there is, you know, there's a big player in there who's played big games and who can lead a defence. Um, he can slip on a banana skin as well, but you know he can lead a defence. And so some of these players have got to step up, and, and it's similar. I think Erdegaard's a far less risky signing because if Erdegaard doesn't show us any more than he showed us in the loan spell, I think he still improves us. Um, but it would still, it would be kind of disappointing if, he didn't end up progressing or getting better, as it would with any 22-year-old player. You kind of you bake in improvement, right? Like with Saka, Saka's brilliant already, but the the excitement about a player like that is, Jesus, how good is he going to be in two to three years? Like if Saka never gets above this level, for example, that that would seem underwhelming. Um, so that the, there is absolutely uh, there is absolutely that risk, and you know the. the Part of it, I think, is the position we're in as well. We've kind of got to gamble on potential, really. And I realise as well, 
that when when you've just made a load of mistakes with a load of older guys, the, the temptation is to go completely in the other direction. And don't get me wrong, this is a better direction, but we probably shouldn't entirely discount, um, you know, you, the 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 importance of like um, of those intangibles like leadership. Some people will call it experience. You know, I'm I'm less sold on that, but. We, we don't know yet that Ramsdale can really command a defense. We don't know that Ben White can really command a defense. Like we're taking, we're taking a bet that they're going to be able to. And so, of course, that's a gamble. I, I do think that that's kind of the position we're in. Um, however, with, with White and Ramsdale, we've probably overpaid. Like with White, we've definitely overpaid, I think. Um, but that's, that's kind of all, like if you get, if you get like a forty million player pound player for fifty million, you d- you don't really quibble that much because you're still getting a really good player, so it, it doesn't really matter that much. But you know, it's it's within the realm of possibility that that they could both just not do it, or they could both like shrivel under the under the lights. You know, they're both coming to a much bigger club, much crueler spotlight, and it obviously it remains to be seen how how they'll handle that. Um, but the, mm. the club do have my sympathy in the respect that, like Sol Campbell, that's that's not available to them anymore. So they kind of no. have to take <laughs> some bets, and so this is going to be down to how how good they are at betting. And let's face it, guys, like we're all products of the Arsenal we grew up with. I'm someone who can't help it. I want to spend the fifty million, the sixty million, the seventy million on a force of nature in the front line, and I want to find cheap, clever solutions at the back. And maybe that leaves you like Arsene Wenger left us at times in the early 2000s where we had a scintillating attack and clown shoes defenses. But like, he kind of found Lauren Koscielny from nowhere, so to speak. Colo Torre, right? I mean, the, Arsene Wenger taught us that defenders can be found and defenders can be made and, and not that Koscielny hit the ground running right away. Um, you know, Per Mertesacker wasn't extravagantly expensive. He came to us in the trolley dash, right? It wasn't exactly the plan from the start. An Arsenal fan and, and I think a, a good servant. The koscielny Per Mertesacker partnership was a good one for many years. We didn't have to spend a ton on it, but we did to get Alexis, right? And we did to get Ozil. And, uh, you know, I, and we did to get Aubameyang for better or worse, where, you know, whatever you think of his, his tenure at the club. And the... The hard part for me is, you know, just ask Liverpool if it was worth it going and spending the money on Virgil van Dijk or Allison. You know, ask City if it was worth it spending the money on Diaz and Ederson. Do I think White and and Ramsdale are in that class? I, I sure hope so. They may be. They may not be. But I, I, I think we have to admit sometimes what our own biases are. My bias definitely is get me that mercurial playmaker or that fleet-footed midfielder or that dynamic attacking player for the big money and I love it and then go get creative and find solutions at keeper and central defender and that's just me. I can't ask the club to to build around what I like to watch but that's certainly going to inform how I react to it. So now we have to hope these guys are good because it may be the case that keeper is more pressing than we had thought, unfortunately. And and maybe now I, I I joked on Twitter, but the joke feels a little more real that Leno's performance against Brentford was designed to get the fan base more on board with the Ramsdale signing. And for me, it certainly has, because I now see that as more of a priority than maybe I did a week ago. I, I think that relationship is trending in the wrong direction. So we have to hope for the best because these, these things are happening. I, I want to finish with two last things. One, whether there's more business to be done this window and two, just a quick look ahead to Chelsea. But before I do that, you know, I think if we can admit that we're biased about certain things. Uh, you know, I think we can admit a lot of things. And one of the things we can admit is that you can do a better job shaving your privates. Like, let's just admit it. Have a look down there for a second. Men, women, whatever you are, have a look. Come on. Is that how you want it to look? Oof. I have problems that can't be solved with a shaver, but that's another issue. Look, the fact is the manscaped stuff is, is how you get it done. Lawnmower 4.0. If you're still wondering, if you're listening and you're like, well, what makes it different from the 3.0? There were a lot of upgrades. There's the button lock, so if it's in your travel bag, it doesn't just get pressed by accident. One of the biggest upgrades that a lot of people called for is the uh, inducting inductive charger, the thing where you just put it in the charging thing, the cradle, that, and it just starts charging. You don't have to like plug it in, which I love. Works in the shower, has a uh, light, has more guards. It still has skin-safe technology, ceramic blades. That's right. You heard it right. I did not fib ceramic blades on Lawnmower 4.0. And it is just an absolute best-in-class, top-of-the-line, dare I say, world-class shaver. The Weed Whacker does the nose and the ears. Comes with all the tonics and lotions if you want. Even come with a a little uh, travel bag. 
so they're, they're a company we love. They, they're aligned with the testicular cancer society as well. And so, you know, always, always good to have a, a philanthropic, uh, approach to business and, and you can understand why they picked that charity given the area of the body that they tend to be targeting. You can go to manscaped.com, use promo code Arsenal Vision, save 20% and get free shipping worldwide. Manscaped.com, promo code Arsenal Vision, 20% off free shipping worldwide. I couldn't put the full m- mustard on this one, the full gusto, because I didn't have Clive. But I will say, Paul, is that enough of that? Caught Paul on mute. Caught Tim on mute. Yes. I got no one is. to tell me if that's enough of no, that. No, I was thinking about it. <laughs> Whether it was enough? You want me to keep yeah, going? Yeah, I was thinking, did I want some more? No, I don't. I think that's okay. enough. I will, um, I, I, will, I will reserve. Upon mature consideration, I think that's yeah, enough. I'm, I'm not going to, you know what, <laughs> and swallow my tongue in the comment I just had. Paul, yeah. uh, the remainder of the window. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people would say the business that we expected to be done that hasn't been done is mm-hmm. now less in the incoming range and more in the outgoing range. Oh, yeah. I certainly am of the opinion that if any more incomings might happen, they'd be Hail Mary, deadline day kind of deals if we get players moved out. Right back, still an issue. Striker, still an issue. I would have liked to Shaka upgrade. I think that that's that dream has died. So it's really striker and right back. Do you think anything happens there, and does it depend on sales? I, I don't think anything's going to happen there. Well, what's been impressive, right? The short version would be we've seen everything coming this weekend, this uh, window. Sorry, um, like we got the guys. If you'd said what were the names right at the start of the window that we're going for outside of the Chaka going and who would replace him, um, and even that one you can say well it was because Chaka was going and now he's here, um, like the names were the names. And there's definitely interest in a right back, but we've got four of the bastards, um, whether we like it or not right now. And like Bellerin wants to move, it, it, like he could certainly go out, which would leave us with um, Chambers plus one other. I don't know if we think Cedric's usable anymore, rather if Arteta thinks he's usable anymore. Um, so that's the most likely area because is Mait- I'm sure if we could get a deal for Maitland Niles, a good one. Um, I think his days with Arsenal, uh, I don't know. I think you you have a moment, and that that moment has gone. I don't think. Um, uh, I don't know where Maitland Niles is at, and even when we used him in preseason, it's not like we had him in a dedicated position. It was like maybe he still is very much on the I'm a central midfielder and that's the kind of loan I l- look for. So we played him in a couple of different positions, one where we needed him at right back and one in midfield. So I assume we're looking for a move for Maitland-Niles permanent or loan. So wh- wh- what would that leave us with? I think there's a reasonable bet somebody has to stay with Chambers and that's either going to be Bellerin uh, or Maitland-Niles or we resurrect Cedric. But there's definitely, like, that's the place there's a hole. We have two experienced and expensive strikers who don't seem to be leaving us, so that's not going to be there. So the big question is around, we've only got the four right-backs, and we've got about one right-back we're kind of happy with. If we, like, put them all on each other's shoulders or tied them Mm -hmm. all together, Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think that, in, that fixes it. Like I don't know if we could get that past the referee, but that that could be the solution, right? Yeah. We're, what was that movie where they sewed the people end to end? What was the name of that one? The human human centipede. Yeah, human centipede. Something like that. I don't know if that's legal now. In, in uh, BoJack Horseman, which is a great show, <laughs> there's the the one of the characters is dating a guy who's clearly just two kids in an overcoat, <laughs> <laughs> like standing on each other's shoulders. <laughs> it's yeah. it's really brilliant. Tim, have you seen that? Uh, no, I haven't. You I've should watch Bojack Horseman. Speed, though. Oh, well, yes. of the two that you could have seen, <laughs> I feel that you may have picked the wrong one. Tim, do you do you agree with Paul's assessment of uh, the remainder of our window in our situation? Yeah, absolutely. I I don't expect any more incomings actually because I think this really will be um, you know wallet shut until players go out, and I don't really see players going out until deadline day, and I I think that's where most of the focus will be. I think most of the noises are you know. Right back striker would be nice, but we have to clear um, some things first, and and I think that just leaves you kind of too much to do because then you're in the kind of land of going to right backs and going to their clubs and saying, okay, we agree all this, but on the proviso that we get rid of all the like it. It just seems like quite a lot to do. Like if we 
got one of those done, I think that would be amazing, um, to be honest. And, and I, I think Arsenal would deserve a lot of credit for that. For me, it's about getting players out now. Like this squad is, it was too big last season and we had the Europa League and it's, it's what, roughly the same size, slightly bigger with returning loanees. Like I, I think a lot of loans are going to happen. A um, whole lot of loans. Uh, there you go. um well i mean if you could wish something not wish because that that's silly that's pointless but if there was one deal an incoming deal that you still think in the back of your mind the part of you that kind of maybe unplugs from the harsh cold reality of this miserable planet uh what deal would you kind of in the back of your mind allow yourself to think might still happen if if Uh, anything maybe there just isn't one i i'd love a right back i i can't really give you a name i haven't i haven't really thought about which right back we might buy i would really like a right back i do think that's something that that needs sorting and i can see becoming a bit niggly um the the striker thing that, that's definitely going to have to happen next summer uh, and i'd like to think that maybe during the course of this season edu and co will start you know perhaps getting the ball rolling on that striker thing um and, you know, putting feelers out and, you know, intensely scouting players who are maybe on their maybe lists who are like 21, 22 or whatever, see how they go this season. Um, start kind of pressing the flesh there because we do have a really, really good striker with a Bamiyang. We just don't know. We just haven't used him properly. And I think if we use him properly, he will be fine this year. I think that that really should be the, the realistic priority there. Um, but mm. I'd love a right back because I just don't like, I think Chambers is fine there, but like, I, I don't think we have, and I think Bellerin has, has kind of checked out as well, um, which I completely understand. And I, I don't think what Arteta needs in a right back really suits him. So th- I, I think that is a, a position that really, really needs sorting. I just can't see it though, because I just can't see us getting rid of who we need to get rid of it's just it's it's such a shame i guess that um maitland niles doesn't want to play there because i i really think that he's probably the one best suited but there you go it's just so funny how your thought process in the summer can erode in the space of 90 minutes because i spent the whole summer being like i've never seen chambers as an arsenal quality right back but maybe i need to just you know update my priors and and see that he can do it and no, now I'm right back to thinking I don't think he can do it. I really don't. And we rewatched the first half of the Brentford game, and I, I do see him as a problem. It doesn't mean he can't have a good game, but I, I don't think he's good enough. And the irony is I think a lot of people right now, if you made them rank the four right backs, might have Maitland-Niles and Cedric as 1-2 in some order, with Bellerin and Chambers as 3-4. I think Arteta's got that order maybe in the complete reverse, which doesn't mean he's wrong but just kind of shows you that the situation there is is a problem. If Bellerin were to move and Maitland-Niles were to move, Cedric ain't going anywhere. Chambers has been here seven years. He's, he's still here. I, I don't see how we could cut that group down enough where they could sanction bringing in another one, although I agree it is a major area of concern. And I think having someone exceptional on the right, seeing what having someone exceptional on the left does, would really help transform an attack that needs it. So let's finish with a look ahead to the weekend. And since I've given Paul a whack at this already, I'll start with you, Tim, and Paul will continue to discuss it with you as well. Mm-hmm. Tim, the lineup for this weekend, I mean, if Aubameyang starts, I think that's a boon. He's got to figure out if he wants to go with the same right back. He's got to figure out if he can trust Pablo Marie after a pretty dicey uh, opening night with Romelu Lukaku probably playing some role in this game and certainly players like Werner, who we saw in preseason, tracking those runs was a huge problem. We played these guys just a couple of weeks ago in the long ball absolutely ripped us apart. So there's a lot of change that has to happen uh, from that preseason game. And I realize it's just preseason and from what happened against Brentford. How do you think Arteta might attempt to to correct some of those issues? Yeah, I, I think Aubameyang will definitely start um, up front. Um, and it sounds like Erdogan won't be available, available pending a visa. So I'm not sure I see the team changing too much other than that. I think I think as ever it's the front like it's the front three positions really where there's always the most kind of uh, room for rotation just because of the number of options we've got like I don't see like the center backs really changing with Gabriel still injured definitely don't see the central midfield pair- pairing change um and neither do I think they should you know if you put a Yang in for Balogun Smith Rowe will play number 10 if Erdogan's not there so really it becomes about the kind of I guess the exterior 
of the attack. I do think that Pepe will start again. Um, and it would it would just be really interesting to see. Um, and, and sorry, and I think Saka will start on the left. And and I I do like as much as I like the idea of Smith Rowe on the left, I do like the idea of Saka on the left as well, just because um, it's one of those, I, I have like um, probably a naively simplistic view of attack sometimes where, you know, I liked Alexis up front because like Alexis good at goals put near goal. Um, and like, and and it's kind of the Future same. Future coach with, Tim speaking. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Alexis takes shots put near goal. See, we don't need Clive on the podcast. We got Tim. <laughs> but but also the the other thing that my other kind of quite simple view is putting your good players close together, and Saka and Tierney are two of our best, and they're two of the ones that play all the time. So I, I do actually like the idea of Saka on the left as well, and I think we saw that when he came on against Brentford. Just his ability to kind of just do that, like one touch, flick the ball around the corner that kind of one touch stuff that we were you know you, you just don't get off Martinelli and Martinelli was playing more like a center forward I think on instruction anyway so I I think it will probably be because he, effectively he's got two choices right he can put Saka he could go Saka right Pepe left he could go Saka right Martinelli left or he could go Pepe right Saka left I think he'll go Pepe right Saka left and I think that's really the only big choice he's got to make unless Ramsdale is signed in time and he really thinks that Leno's not doing it and he wants to put Ramsdale in. I, I don't see that happening. I think Ramsdale will play West Brom um, in the Carabao Cup on, on Wednesday night. That seems like a much Interesting. more natural debut um, for him, actually. So that, that that's, that's the big decision. I, I, just overall on the game, for me, what our chances really rest on is more what Chelsea do up front. And as much as I really want Aubameyang available for us, I really hope Lukaku doesn't or can't start. Um, but unfortunately, <laughs> I, I think he might. And uh, honestly, for me, the thought of Lukaku running in from the right on the ball, Werner running in from the left off the ball, like I, I think, honestly, I think Chelsea have nailed it in attack and I think they're going to win the league, unfortunately. Oh, gosh. This pod was going so well until just then. Yeah, I mean, when I think about... Drogba and Costa and now Lukaku, like, haven't we had enough of bullying Chelsea center forwards, embarrassing Arsenal central defenders? Like, I, I sure hope we don't see that. I think, Paul, that this is a game, as much as I am loath to admit it, that is more about keeping them out than uh, us going for it. I was very harsh last season on this team when we played games like the the second game against Liverpool where we just really weren't part of the contest. I'd be okay if discretion is the better part of Valor here. But in terms of the upfront side of things, one of the things I'm really curious to see is what happens with Pepe now. Sack is back in full training. Smith Rowe, if Odegaard can play, <clears throat> maybe in line to move off to the left, although that may not happen quite this week. Nicola Pepe finished last season probably as our best player in just purely in terms of form. He didn't have his best game against Brentford. I think he did okay in a, in a game where no one in the front three really impressed or front four, I guess, Smith Rowe. Um, I wonder if Arteta is going to have a short leash with Pepe as a player who he just hasn't seemed to totally warm to at times, or if he will have looked at last season and realized this is a player that that is really important for what he wants to try to do. I mean, that that's a position that I really have my eye on. Do you think Pepe's position continues to maybe be the vulnerable one in that front four? Yep. Yep. I think uh, obviously the way to stay in is score goals. But if he's not scoring goals, look, it'll be a little different when Odegaard's around because Odegaard will tell Pepe when to move, where to move. Uh, I I don't see with Pepe a good orchestrator's mind. I see this just this tendency to come in and to recirculate the ball to the other side of the pitch, to miss overlapping fullbacks when they're there, uh, to not catch the Smith Row run when he makes it. And so... Uh, as much as anybody's career, I think Pepe needs Odegaard there uh, to tell him when to do the thing. Like he has the skills, he he has the dribble, but he, he he is the dribble when he's got two or three people to beat, not when he has one person to beat. He doesn't go to the byline, even though he's a. We've seen time and time again his. We think he's very one-footed, but when he bothers to use the right foot, it's a good right foot. 
either shot or cross or pass. Um, there's much more you can get out of Nicolas Pepe. And Arteta spent a lot of time working with him last season, uh, we were told. But he interestingly said, now it's up to Pepe uh, in a way that said he wasn't entirely convinced that uh, although Pepe had been in the training sessions, um, he had fully mastered it. But with Odegaard in that corner, that could be the lifesaver for Pepe. Um, I uh, like this. Could, if if we nick a goal in this, it could be quite a counter-attacking goal, and that's that's a reason to have Pepe on the pitch. I think that yeah, <clears throat> that is actually a really good point, Paul. I, I think when it comes to counter-attacking, he's a player you'd want there. I mean, Martinelli is too. And this is the funny thing: this seasons can be sliding doors moments. I mean, yeah. Tim Martinelli and Pepe start against Brentford. They each score a goal and each get an assist in a comfortable win. And suddenly we look at them as two indispensable players with end product who have to play. And the season goes in one direction. Martinelli's invisible, you know, not really in the game. Some, some of it through the fault of players bypassing him, some of it through the fault of his own. Let's be clear. Same with Pepe. And now we're looking at a situation where both of those players probably have to see their positions as vulnerable with Odegaard coming in and maybe Smith Rowe and Saka being options ahead of them on either flank. I, I think this is another game where I would want Martinelli and Pepe playing because I think there'll be a lot of transition football, and we've seen what Martinelli can do, specifically against Chelsea in transition. Pepe has done that as well in our FA Cup run. Is is this sort of the unfortunate reality that the, the, the Brentford performance means that those two players in particular who had a chance to really maybe cement a position or, or show their value by not doing so have now thrown their position as you know, potential starters really in the doubt. Uh, it's, that, that's all just in the name of competition, and it's one of um, I guess that's the a only, good point. <laughs> one of the only areas in the team where we really have it. What what I'd say is, I I think we saw against Brentford. I, I don't think you can play Pepe and Martinelli um, on either flank. I, I think you need more of a, a connector but, somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that can be Saka, it can be Smith Rowe, um, but I th- I think really you can only play one of Martinelli and Pepe. And that, that for me, is going to be one of the interesting subtexts of this season about which one Arteta really, again, to use that phrase, bets on. Um, I've got a feeling it might be Martinelli. I've got a feeling that he'll see a, play, a young player that he can work with, whereas Pepe's kind of flaws are, are kind of there. I think we saw that against Brentford. I, th- I think what we see with Pepe is really... <laughs> He, he's only really useful in the final 25 yards and Brentford were really good at crowding him out and sending him backwards and he, he couldn't really do anything at that stage. Like he, he's great. Like if you, if he can work the ball onto his left foot in the last 25 yards, he's great, but he can't really do anything else. Um, and, and look, I'm, I'm not saying that Martinelli is much different at this stage. Like he's, he's a shot monster, right? He wants the ball on his right foot and he wants to shoot. And I, I really think there's probably only room for one of those players um, when we come to look at it this time next year. And I suspect that that, I, and I kind of hope it would be Martinelli, which is not yeah. to say I'm like completely writing Pepe off and think he's used, like he'll score plenty of goals um, this season. But I, I, think... I guess we're, sorry, I was just going to say, I guess we're that sort of binary or, or that could break down, that hypothetical is if both Aubameyang and Lacazette were to go, there may be an opening for Martinelli to be a center forward, center forward. option. It, yeah, which might bring both of them back yeah. in the frame, although I still tend to agree with you. Yeah, yeah, it could do. I, th- I think he'd have to go some way to proving that, you know, significantly this season in in a lot of, in, you know, a, a good section of games. And I'm, I'm not sure I see that happening. But, but yeah, like ultimately, neither of them really performed um, at Brentford. I'd say that there's more mitigation for Martinelli uh, there, given that he'd only just come back from the Olympics, um, so 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 I, I don't think we could play both of them, and I don't think there'd be room to either. I think really, what they're kind of campaigning for is twelfth man at this stage. Be mm. that you know someone's injured, we need another left winger, we need to rest Saka, whatever, or first man off the bench. I think what well, that's what those two players are really vying for this season. Yeah, I guess the next window of opportunity to really cement a place would be African Cup of Nations <clears throat> yeah, when exactly. those positions will be open again. Uh, Tim, one thing, you, you tend to have a really good memory for details that I don't. I was trying to think about Arteta and the way he talks about players. And I think it was a Smith-Rowe comment last 
season, he said, oh, you know, yeah, it's great. He's doing well, but the Arsenal number 10 has to have 15 goals and 10 assists and he has the ability he needs to get there. It was sort of like a compliment wrapped in a, in a critique. Now, to be fair, yeah. there's like one play, one player season who puts up those numbers. So I don't know if that if that's a fair expectation. But like with Pepe, he was pretty hard on him after that headbutt thing. Obviously, I'm understandable, the red card. Uh, with Aubameyang, he said, I don't know, maybe he's in decline. Does Arteta have sort of a weird <laughs> tendency to be kind of a publicly critical manager? I'm trying to think of situations mm-hmm. where he's been effusive in praise. And I'm not saying that's the only way to do it, by the way. And, and behind the scenes, he, he could be a total arm around the shoulder guy. But do you start to get the sense from Arteta that it wouldn't hurt him to maybe, especially with a young core, to be a little bit more publicly reassuring about some of these players? Because he, he does seem to be a little reserved in the way he wants to compliment his players. Yeah, yeah. And and I'm sure that's that's a deliberate tactic. Uh, I'm sure that's about, you know, kind of trying to Motivation. get the best. For, yeah, 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 absolutely. I think what I'd say, because obviously we, we don't really know what he's like behind the scenes and things like that. Well, one a theory I've been kind of workshopping with Arteta that I've been well it's not a theory it's, it's how I feel and uh, it's not important for anything and I'm not saying it makes Arteta a bad manager or, or that it's relevant really in any way but one of the things I've been surprised about is um, how little I've I've felt connected to or related to Arteta like I really liked him as a player I liked him as a captain and he really wanted to, you know, again, going back to what I said about Erdogan, he really wanted to manage Arsenal. He really wanted to come back to Arsenal. And I was thinking, ah, oh, here we go. This is like, I don't know if I had something a, a bit like George Graham-esque in my mind. It's like, he, here's the man who knows the club, really was grateful to play for the club because he got the move late in his career, took the club to his heart, really wants to, you know. And I thought, ah, oh, th- and here's a guy like I'm really going to relate to. You know, and, and that opening press conference and you think, yes, you're hitting all the right notes. And actually, I, I haven't on a personal level because he's quite, he is quite, I don't want to use the phrase charmless because that sounds like really critical. But do you know what I mean? Like, I, I haven't really, just on a purely like personal emotional level, I haven't related to him in the way that I thought that I was going to. And uh, and yeah yeah like I, he he's very 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 straight faced isn't he like in in the way he deals with questions in the media and all, pretty much all of his public utterances like he is absolutely rigidly poker faced like he really really is um, which mm. again is is not necessarily a criticism it's that, that it's perfectly fine to be like that but I, I guess I was I've been like slightly surprised. Um, by that just just overall yeah yeah uh, paul i guess we can just finish with this and, and that was just more I, that is not a pointed comment tim like i wasn't trying to like lead you to you know some yeah, kind sure. of criticism of arteta it's just an observation right every manager has a slightly different way of motivating their players and i do wonder it is becoming a very young team a team that you know will need its confidence need its leadership and especially if we start to move out you know, the Willian, Lacazette, Aubameyang group, where's the senior leadership left? It's really basically, you know, David Luiz is gone. It's like Shaka and Party, you know, and I, I don't know if Thomas Party feels like it's his time to be a leader yet in and out of the team, only been here sort of half a season. So it'd be interesting to see, and that leadership can obviously come from the the manager, but he's still learning and and, you know, understanding what motivates the players is part of being a good coach and something he'll learn about. So Paul, do you, do you have a sense? I mean, in in terms of what you think might happen this weekend, coming off of Brentford, I was very, very low. Then the whole week goes by. And by Thursday, you're like, ah, easy three, nil victory at home over Chelsea. So (laughs) I find myself expecting it to be better than maybe is reasonable. They do look pretty formidable. They do have a very strong side coming in, knowing exactly the kind of football they want to play. Having, you know, been champions of Europe, they got off to a good start, uh, on their opening day. Is there a chance that this could be a really, really difficult day at the Emirates and we might start to hear some fan uh, unrest, so to speak? Or, or do you think maybe just maybe it's another case of uh, of Arsenal being best when we can play sort of like the smaller team, which has, to be fair, often been the case under Arteta? Um, well, I won't talk to the fan on, on rest piece because we actually have a resident expert on the pod who probably can has seen these occasions before. Um, here's like we could get battered this weekend I think we all know that Um, if we don't get battered I think there's a reasonable chance it's because like it or not they've pushed us back 
and we might actually see a good performance out of Pablo Mari because he's going to have like my biggest concerns over with Pablo Mari are not running alongside a striker. It's uh, a striker running straight at him, uh, 1v1. And like Chaka did a p- pretty good job against Brentford getting back to cover Mari. I know we talked about it in the rewatch and there was concerns about how often Chaka dropped deep into the back line earlier than he needed to, etc. But I think we'll see across the game that actually – um, uh, some assistance for Pablo Mari so that he has coverage was was kind of critical in a number of situations. Um, he's not a guy, a centre-back you want feet planted with a f- fast attacking player coming at him. And I'm not sure that that's what this Chelsea game will be. I think we're we're going to see ourselves mostly back, whether we like it or not, in set in position and for me the weak position might be the chambers one uh, because he doesn't have the quick feet i think this could be a game i'm not saying pablo murray is going to have a great game but i won't be shocked if he has a good game in this one this this could be the kind of game where a bit like we say oh the keeper was good because he was busy well pablo murray might be very busy in this game doing center back stuff in the in the box uh heading heading the ball clear. He'll have got the message from the Brentford throw in that he needs to be more physical, more aggressive. He could end up having a good game this time around. And we're like a little confused. Um, And so it's an opportunity for our back six or so to get set, get in position and play well together. Uh, I think it's going to be challenging. We're going to have to try and nick a goal on the counter. We're not going to dominate the midfield with Chaka and Lakanga. Um, our front four are going to have to be very busy with pressing and defending, try and nick a goal. I don't think we're going to be able to impose ourselves on them. I don't know how the crowd will see that being as it's at the Emirates and they want to see a performance. Uh, Maybe it'll be a bit more open than that at at times, but I think we're going to struggle to dictate the play would be my guess. Yeah, well, I think we can all agree we'd like us to win, right? Yeah. Yeah. Tim, yeah? Like us to win? Yeah, you, you could get me on board with that. All right. I think we should stop there because that's the level of analysis that I've been striving for in the last 90 minutes. We finally reached it. So you can put it down. You can come back to us with this. I'm willing to stand behind this. Tim, Paul, and I, all on record, would like us to beat Chelsea at the Emirates on Sunday. And uh, the only downside is that I will not be there uh, with a bunch of Arsenal fans in Las Vegas getting more drunk than you should be at that time of day and dunking on some Chelsea fans. But look, hope springs eternal. This is the reality. This is a great thing about being a fan. We can know all the problems, know all the challenges, know all the odds and go into this game feeling good, being excited and thinking the best could happen. Now, Paul might argue that it's precisely that mentality that leads me to be as outraged as I usually am at full time, but I'm not changing it. Damn it, Paul's on Twitter. Pause no everything. Pants, thanks, pause. Woohoo! And Tim's on Twitter. Just a better thanks, Tim. Brazil around. Brazil blah blah blah. Brazil Rob. Sorry, Clarence. My name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter at Yankee Gunner. We love you. For goodness sake, Arsenal. Come on. We will talk to you after Arsenal 10. Chelsea nil. No.